Ann Bocock, and welcome to Between the Covers. Andrew Gross is the best-selling author of 16 thrillers. Five of those co-authored with James Patterson hit the number one spot on the New York Times bestseller list. Well, a couple books ago, he made a literary shift. The books are still thrillers, but they're based on history. The One Man and the Saboteur were stories about the Holocaust and World War II. His new book, Button Man, is definitely a thriller. It's steeped in history, but the setting may well surprise you. Early 1900s, New York and the dawn of the women's garment industry. Please welcome the author of Button Man, Andrew Gross. Thanks, Ann. Great to be back. Thank you for being here. I, I want to get right into this. The time frame starts around 1905. I believe it goes into most of it into the, 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 the mid-30s. 30s. Mm -hmm. This is the rise of organized Jewish organized crime, mm -hmm. which took me back for a minute. I didn't, wasn't familiar with that. And I knew you were writing a book about the garment industry. The title of the book is Button Man. So naive me thinks Button Man is a garment industry term. Uh -huh. Not exactly. Not exactly. No, no, no. Uh, what most people don't realize is that a button man was slang back in the day for a mob hitman. And um, um, I didn't even come up with a title, actually. I'll take credit for it. But it, we, I, I wrote the book under the title Rag Wars. And because it really is a story of the, okay. of, of, the, of wars within the garment business and the early stages of the garment business where it was populated by really tough characters who grew up on the Lower East Side. Um, and for whatever reason, my publisher, um, I'm also co-published in England and RAG has a whole different connotation in London, um, um, decided it just wasn't going to fly. So my but publisher great came up title. with it. Yeah, great yeah, title. Yeah. So the Jewish mob is in control before the Italian mob? How, does, how is this? Well, what a lot of people don't realize, um, except the Jews, is that <laughs> uh, back in the day, um, the Jewish mob was far more fierce and bloody than the Italian mob, and the day being the 1920s and 30s. Um, you know, uh, criminals and very flamboyant ones like um, Arnold Rothstein, who fixed the 1919 World Series, and Dutch Schultz, who had literally a hundred uh, mob uh, uh, rubouts on his resume, uh, and Louis Lepke. These were the most uh, um, dreaded killers, and the Italian mob actually would farm out its dirty work, its hits, to the Jewish mob back then, who turned it into a business for hire, a business for profit, hence the name Murder Incorporated. So let's talk about Murder Incorporated, if, if we can. Um, and you did mention Dutch Schultz. You, you mentioned some of the other names. One name you left out, perhaps it, uh, Dewey. Well, Dewey was on, was was the prosecutor. Was the special prosecutor. He actually became governor, governor of New York, and he actually ran for president. But back um, in the '30s, uh, when this book takes place, he was probably the most. Uh, um, um, a trusted um, lawman, uh, uh, even more than Elliot Ness, and he uh, he was unbribable, and he was given the task of uh, basically putting away these hardened killers who were controlling New York at that time. Um, their, you know, extortion, gambling, um, at a certain point, uh, bootlegging. And, and murder for hire, this is what the mob was into then. So he was tasked with uh, putting it behind bars. Where did the name Murder Incorporated come from? Um, it actually, uh, um, it, it, well, you know, I, I guess it, it, it came from the fact that they turned rubbing out hits into a business. And it was a business for profit. Meyer Lansky apparently came up with the term. In, in this book, In Button Man, I, I want to talk about the setting. We have... A fam it's a family story. It's my family story. Yeah. It is your family story. Yeah. And yeah. there are three brothers in this book, Morris, Saul, Harry. They're right. all on different trajectories. But if you would talk about this family for a moment. Well, the book begins on the Lower East Side, um, where this family loses their father, and they all have to change the course of their own lives. They're poor. It's totally, you know, the Lower East Side was the most densely populated area in the world at that time, even more so than Calcutta, mm -hmm. India. 
it was impoverished. Uh, there was really one way, to, well, two ways out, let's say, for the Jews who lived there. One was the garment business, which had no barriers to entry, and the other was crime. So you went one way or the other. These are very tough characters that lived there because there was crime on every corner, whether it was illegal gambling scans or prostitution. So you have these three brothers. Um, you have Morris, who is the hero of the story, who um, you know, basically is a person that is big, strong, comfortable using his fists, grows up on the streets, but he has an unshakable moral center. You have his older brother, Saul, who is going to accounting school, and then once his father dies, has to give that up in order to help support the family. And then Harry, as you mentioned, who is scarred by a family tragedy when he's just a child, and uh, which he carries with him all through his life, and he ends up being seduced into a life of crime. And we're not going to talk about this tragedy. You have to read the book to get to, to mm -hmm. that part. This is an immigrant story. Mm -hmm. This is an American dream story. These people come to America. They, despite all of these obstacles, they have to make their way. Well, you nailed it, because that's how I look at the book. I mean, it is a thriller, but it grows into being a thriller. What's really mm -hmm. at stake here is how people chart their lives from poverty and total disenfranchisement into becoming part of society and then, in, and then you know, elements of betrayal that will tear that down from them. I call the book a combination, or I view the book as a combination of, of like Dickens' Great Expectations yeah. meets The Godfather. And, <laughs> and Great Expectations it's because it's really a book that takes place over multi-decades against a background of class struggle. Um, and, and, and it is a boy to manhood story in the same way that Dickens' novel is. And then The Godfather, of course, because of its depiction of organized crime and its unique um, you know, cultural uh, um, way about it, in this case, not the Italians, but, but the Jews. The Jews. You talk about a, a boy to manhood story. Kids had to grow up very fast. It was the norm, and especially in this family, they lost their dad, that kids had to work to help put food on the table. Well, the hero here is working at 12 years old, and he's kind of a dynamic figure who, by the time he is 19, he's running the entire business. Um, by the time he's 16, he's taken the job of a 60-year-old craftsman who was a marker maker. So, you know, what's interesting is, is I spent time in the garment business before I started writing. Um, it really is my family story, and this is really my grandfather's tale that I've told here. Uh, a lot of the book is italicized. There are chap many chapters where um, you know, Morris goes through situations that are, are totally anecdotal because they're part of my grandfather's of story, history. totally. And they're basically there as, 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 um, as they were sort of told to me as I grew up. So it's a very rich story in terms of you know, Jewish uh, cultural history and at the same time I think has enough tension and suspense to be a pretty good thriller. Do you ever think to compare generations, like what we have now compare and what we go through now? You can't. No, I love these first generation stories because they're irretrievable. You know, we'll never, we'll never live through them again. You know, now maybe Latinos might be, in, in many ways, might be looking at that and saying, one day they'll talk about this generation as that first generation. But for the European cultures, this is, you know, this is the, when they emigrated here between 19, 1880 and 1920, 20 million people came to this country. You, and, you talked about it being as densely populated as, um, as it was in that era. The last time I was in New York, and I had a few hours to kill, I went to the uh, Lower East Side to the, to tenement, the tenement Museum. The tenement Great museum. place. I recommend it to everybody. I, I do too. Yeah. And I can see yeah. this family come to life right, right there. Right. Well, you know, I don't think this is a uniquely Jewish story because what makes stories great is, is, that, is that they're transferable to any culture and they become universal. And to me, that's what makes art, you know, uh, uh, really, you know, sing as opposed to just be a typical genre story. Um, but, but basically, um, you know, this is, this is a Jewish story and this is the story of, 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 of how a generation grew into becoming Americans. It, it's the Rabishevsky family. Right, who became Rob. Became, became Rob. They, they shortened it as many mm -hmm. Jews did. 
in this is, as you said, your grandfather's story. Mm -hmm. I think we need to talk about your grandfather mm -hmm. for a bit. How did, Morris's story is in the book, I'm not gonna give a lot away, but how did that mirror your grandfather? This, this is a guy who's working at 12 years old. Yeah, I mean, my grandfather was, the, was uh, born in Poland, came here. Um, by the time he, 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 he left the fifth grade in order to help support the family when their father died, um, um, he, was, he was literally 12 years old by, in his life. By the time he was 18 or 19, um, he was running this company. Um, he grew on to open a fledgling company of his own and ended up battling um, the, uh, uh, the Jewish mob who uh, basically had taken over the unions. Uh, it was still even the ILGWU, but there were many fur and coat unions. And the, uh, and the, and the mob took it over. Basically, they, would, uh, um, they were taking over the dues and they took over the chain of supply where they were forcing people to buy from mob uh, approved resources, so they were getting it in both ways. And my grandfather fought the mob, and to the day that he died, he would be happy to lift his shirt and show you the two stab wounds that he got, courtesy of Louis Lepke's uh, henchman, Gara. Um, so and then, that part's real. That part is real. Um, and then at some point, he grew his fledgling company into a national brand named after his daughter, Leslie Fay. And, uh, I think some uh, of you I think obviously a few remember. People obviously, it. Yeah. Re remember Leslie Fay. Yeah. In the book, there is a scene in the book where Morris has been paid in cash, obviously, and and he's got a few dollars in his pocket, and his family needs this money, and he has to walk across home. the Lower East Side to get home. And he is so afraid of being rolled and you know, all this money, all this work could be gone mm -hmm. for, for, for naught. Did that story happen? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, well, here's the deal. That story probably happened countless times, but I don't think it was part of my grandfather's life. Whenever I go to a bookstore and read, that is the chapter that I read from because it gives yeah. a great sense of what the Lower East Side was like mm -hmm. and the threats of the Lower East Side and what it was like to have to walk, just to walk home you were running into all these people that would roll you and rob you blind. And don't forget, even though my grandfather, at least the character, I should say, wasn't dressed like this, a lot of them are dressed in, in dark uh, uh, garb and have side curls and yarmulkes and just don't look or talk like anyone else. So they were easy prey for e even to the Jews who would prey on them themselves. There is a line in the book, don't let the yarmulkes fool you. These guys will rob you blind. And you know. You, we, we did talk about it was, no, it was the norm for kids to work, but what we left out of that sentence was it was also the norm for kids to drop out of school because they, they had to work. Yeah. Your grandfather's level of education? Fifth grade. But, uh, you know, he was one of those guys. I mean, I sometimes talk a little about this whole generation of, of people who, went, who founded these companies, whether it was, you know, Leslie Fay or Russ Tuggs or Jonathan Logan or r &K or these sort of companies. And these were the toughest men I knew. I was in the business for quite a while. And, you know, I think I can say it on air that these were men that uh, if they yelled at you, you could piss in your pants right in front of them. They were, they were fearsome. And we used to call them animals. And everyone would call my grandfather an animal or a killer. That was another expression because they were really intense and they were single-minded. Um, and, and yet, and, 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 and just as much as the bad guys, as the people who went into crime and became killer, these men, these men were just as tough. And I, I will tell you that whether it was knowing a lot of these people, a lot of them were Palm Beach Country Club members and things like that, um, <laughs> they would tell you over a gin game or after a round of golf that Freddie Pomerantz was the toughest of any of them, so. All right, so growing up, was your grandfather a storyteller about this or not? Well, I will tell you one part of that that may be interesting. Um, obviously, in writing a book like this, you have to do research um, about the time, you know. And even though I knew a lot about the industry, and even though my grandfather, I was sort of the repository of his stories growing up. So I knew them all backwards and forwards, and long before I ever intended 
to before I even intended to have a career about writing fiction. And even as I've written a lot of fiction, I never thought that these stories might have an appeal beyond our own family lore. But when I was doing research originally, I went to FIT in New York, to the Fashion Institute of Technology, and I went to the head of archives there, whose name is Karen Trevet, and said, I want to get whatever you can show me about the time. And after, after taking me through a lot of old copies of Women's Wear Daily that were on microfilm from the 20s, uh, yeah. and, you know, or literally back from like 1922 and 23, she said something to me and gave me a gift that I will never forget. She said, many of the founding fathers of the industry um, have, given, uh, have made tapes of their early years as part of the, as part of the oral archives here your grandfather among them, would you like to listen to it? That just, it, and, it takes my breath away. I know, you know? I, and, and that was how 30 years after he died, I got to hear his voice all over again. Um, but on a personal level, he was always a very patriarchal figure to me. So when I got this gift of listening to him again, it was, it was pretty emotional for me. I, I certainly shed a lot of tears listening to these I, stories. I would think so. Yeah, How, yeah. Were there hours uh, of? Two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. Yeah, yeah. And some of it, a lot of it ended up going farther than I was writing about into, you know, in, into the building this, his, his company, which by that point was being run by his son. Um, but what I was you know, totally interested in were the early years, you know. But if you hadn't embarked on writing this, never would have you discovered never would that. have known that. No, 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 never. A right. Even his son knew nothing about it, you know. Yeah, yeah. All right, so take off the author hat for a moment. And, and as a grandson, how did that, what was that experience like it, for you? It was uh, it, just a totally compelling thing, especially given what I said about how important a figure he was in my life, you know. I mean, you know, his name was Freddie Pomerantz, and everyone in South Florida knew Freddie Pomerantz. Mm -hmm. He was a very charismatic guy with a big sort of orbit, and he was, you know, he was, uh, he was a real character. They just don't make many like that. And, and then the other thing is in terms of business, how, how you know, the, the early years of the garment business is really how the Jews grew to define themselves as a, mm -hmm. as a culture. You know, I always sort of say half the Jews in America came from the Lower East Side and the other half went into the garment business, you know. <laughs> so we've got it all covered here. And so, you know, just hearing his story and how he got his first, they weren't promotions. He basically took other people's jobs. Some of it is in the book. I mean, some of, the, some of those stories are in the book and they're not necessarily they're for reasons of, of suspense, of thriller. They're just, they're just really captivating stories. You know? Your grandfather, I think, was as tough as Morris, maybe even tougher after mm -hmm. you know, what we're talking about today. Your books, all your books have heroes. He was a hero to you. Yeah, well, one, in real life, he was a, he was a hero, hero to me. But two, you, know, you have to be a little careful. I write fiction. And, and the more we talk about things like this, it's almost like I'm writing an autobiography. But it's and, not. And even though, no, it's not. And even though I've sort of pulled stories, I write suspense. And when you write suspense, you have to deal a bit in hyperbole and, and you know, certainly in the make-believe. And, and, and you're sort of trying to, you know, grip readers. And in order to do so, you do have to push the envelope a little bit. And so it really isn't a literal telling of his, of what he went through, although he did, no question, stand up to the mob in his day. But the main character in the book uh, really becomes the, the only person who can help. Uh, one of the other characters is, is Lewis Buckhalter. And Lewis Buckhalter, uh, who grew up in the same streets, turned to crime, became Louis Lepke. Mm -hmm. And Louis Lepke was the bloodiest killer of his generation. You, I think you've already answered it, but to me, Button Man is its own great expectation. Yeah, story. well, I, well then, I, and, in and, a modest way, okay. I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have to say how impressed I was how you put the fictional characters in with the real, real. characters, and it was seamless. It, it, you know, when you're writing historical, where there are elements of historical fiction, that can get tricky. Right. You can, and, and, and thank you, and I appreciate that because that's part of my, what I think is really good about the book and I take some pride in. But if, if, if you guys remember uh, Ragtime, that book by Dr. O, I think, you know, not to throw another book out, sort of that it's modeled after, but I think there is an element of Ragtime because um, a lot of the characters are real figures here, both good guys and bad guys. 
And, and you're, but they come across more as characters than they do historical figures, I think. When you're writing a family story, and this is essentially, um, it is mm -hmm. a thriller, but it's a family story, and it is your family to some degree, is there a protectiveness? Do, do you feel on some level that you have to honor the well, history I, of your family? I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. I... Um, didn't really know how to write this book. I, first of all, I didn't know that this book would be interesting to a lot of people other than if I decided to write a memoir. And I didn't want to compromise our family lore mm -hmm. for the sake of writing a thriller and for entertainment purposes to people because, but the thing is I get paid to write thrillers. <laughs> I don't get paid to write family okay. memoirs, you know? And I thought about it, and I really was having trouble for a long time figuring, how am I going to turn this into a thriller, and do I want to take what are essentially sacred stories to my family and turn them into the fodder of a, of a suspense novel? So in that sense, I was very protective of it because, you know, this is, you know, it's our holy book, if that's the right way to put it, in our clan. And I'm a believer that someone in every clan should be writing these stories because we don't have a monopoly on sort of interesting mm -hmm. stories in our family. Every family has gone through these kind of struggles, these kind of reversals, betrayal, redemption. And I think this book does cover all of those dynamics, uh, you know, in, in the book. But I, I, I had a lot of difficulty trying to allow myself to write it. And, and you know, but, you know, unlike Jim Patterson, who years and years ago I did do books with, I don't get... 10 thriller ideas a year. You know, I'm happy to latch on to one and do a good job with it. So um, I, it was hard to let this one go. And so I guess in my own way, I was trying to convince myself that it was OK to write it and turn it into a thriller and not a, and not a memoir and not a biography. Well, you know? as you said, there, there is betrayal. Um, there are some brutal scenes for anyone who thinks that it's a nice little family story. It is yeah. anything but. Um, Family stories are complicated, no matter whose family they are. Well, that's, uh, someone said that. Someone important said that at some <laughs> point. You know, I, I, I say that because I, I spent a lot of time in this. It was a public company, but it was basically a family public company. And I always say that, uh, you know, it's great to be in a family-run business because you can grow to your level of expertise as fast as possible. Um, but the problem with being in a family-run business is that it's filled with your own family. Yeah. <laughs> and in my case, I ended up outside of the family business, hence my writing career. <laughs> the dedication page is to Fred P. Pomerantz Pop, and it says, only wish you were around to read this. What would he say? I think he'd be pretty proud. Uh, you know, now you're making me get a little <laughs> misty here. Um, I think he'd be pretty proud. I, I think he, you know, or, or either that or he'd say, like, what are you wasting your time writing novels for? You should get in, you know, go back in the business and make a real living, you know? So. Was it okay to take a few questions Absolutely. now? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes, what sir. is the difference between co authoring a book with someone like James Patterson and writing a book completely on your own? About a million dollars. What is the difference between, well, we won't, we won't, we, I didn't tell you which way though. <laughs> um, I, I um, you know, I, I did do uh, a bunch of books with Jim a few years, you know, now about 15 years ago, so it's been a while. And, um, you know, it was a great experience for me, um, both in the process of working with him and the fact that I had never published a word when he first found me. So it certainly changed my writing career. Uh, I'd like to know how the rest of your family feels about your airing the, lawn, the family laundry. It's pretty dignified in terms of the family. So nobody's given me any negative feedback Good. any more than I normally get negative feedback <laughs> from my family. So um, it was actually a good experience for my own kids to learn about this side of it too because, you know, these first generation stories have a way of dying out unless someone tells them. I'm anxious to know what your next work oh. is. <laughs> the name of it is The Fifth Column. In the years before World War II, especially in New York, um, and in the Upper East Side, and let's say the area of Yorkville, which was a really German neighborhood, uh, there was a lot of pro-Nazi sentiment. Um, the State Department, and there are plenty of books you can read on this, um, had a lot of Nazi sympathizers in them. Charles Lindbergh, 
who was the second most admired person in the country back then, was a clear Nazi uh, uh, sympathizer. Um, in, in Yorkville, there were open um, um, Nazi rallies and, and, and celebrations, and bars would play German songs, and swastikas were out, and Hitler's image was all hmm. over. You know, and then in 1939, in February, 22,000 Nazi sympathizers packed Madison Square Garden in their brown shirts and, and swastikas uh, for a rally. So uh, there was a lot of fear that, uh, that saboteurs and spies were in this country, you know, as part of this group. So the story is really about this young couple living in Yorkville in a brownstone who begin to feel that the kindly Swiss couple down the hall mm. might be Nazi spies. History comes alive in the story of immigrants. It's the dawn of the women's garment industry, organized crime, and the title is Button Man. Andrew Gross, it has been such a pleasure Thanks to again. have you here. Great. I'm Ann Bocock. Please connect with us and join me on the next Between the Covers. Super. Thank, Thank you. you.